So thank you all. Uh, my partner and I, Amy, want to say that you guys make it really hard for us. We had a great round and I was talking to some other people and I think it's going to be a very tough decision. So give yourselves all a round of a hand. You did it. Yay! So as we're waiting for them to tabulate the scores, I would like to introduce to you a very special person, and I'm going to have him come up here. And some of you may already know him as your professor, Dr. Johnston. So Dr. Johnston, come on up. <laughs> so have him come on up here. Very special man. Uh, if you have had him for class, you may know that he's an excellent instructor and he's worked at Parkland for many years. And I'm just going to give you a few things about him. I'm going to let him say a little bit about himself. But we really want to say thank you to you, George, because he has done so much for this department and for this college and nationwide. So let me give you just a few items uh, briefly. I could probably go on for a long time. So George has been at Parkland College since 1983, so been here a very long time. Not only has he done a lot for our department, the Fine Arts Department, and has been an instructor for us for many years, but he actually has worked, he's multi-talented, uh, he's worked in multiple departments, so he started out more in the uh, computer science area, wasn't that correct? So he's done not only teaching, works uh, public speaking, he's an expert in theater, he's done stuff in computer science, so lots of things in different areas of the college. But not only that, he was also for quite a long time our director of institutional research, so has done a lot of uh, technical stuff. I can only admire his uh, ability to do numbers and crunch things and see the big picture. And because of that particular talent, he is on, uh, has been used nationwide. So he has been working uh, for the Higher Learning Commission, which is the organization that does accreditation for community colleges. So he actually has gone all over the country. He's traveled nationwide and he goes into these community colleges <coughs> and he's the one that evaluates them and looks at all the different factors and lets them know if they are on the right track and gives them advice. So a really valuable resource that we have somebody like that that goes all over the country and uh, does that because obviously Parkland has to be accredited as well. So such a great resource for that. And then personally, I just can't tell you enough how wonderful it is to work for George. He's always there for you. He's always positive. Uh, he's always, uh, you know, happy to do stuff for the department, and he's done so much for us. Uh, he's gotten uh, the Rotary After Five, which is one of our sponsoring organizations involved, and they donate the first prize uh, $1,000 every year, so he was the one that was instrumental in, in getting that involvement and getting them involved in that, so we can't thank him enough for that. But just the dedication that he's shown every, every single year uh, to Parkland. And we're so sad because this is his last, uh, almost last semester. He's going to teach in the summer and then he is actually going to retire for good. Uh, <laughs> so please, please help me in thanking George and giving him a big round of applause. Thank you. I don't know, do you want to say anything? Okay. They threatened to bring my wife in tonight, but I think she actually went to the Rotary Club meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to be late, and I have to give my yeah, I'll give, I'll give okay. excuse for you. Okay. <laughs> well, I really am honored for this, but, but the real honor belongs to David Jones. Um, David and I both came from Kansas. We grew up not too far from each other. And he was always my mentor when I first started in an administration. David had already made that leap from faculty to administration. And it's, for those of you, it's a change. It's a change in lifestyles. Uh, so David kind of walked me through that process as I was learning how to be an administrator. So to me, this is an honor to be able to honor David. So we have our celebrity panel of judges. And I will start with Matt Hertz, who is a humanities professor here at Parkland College. Cynthia Bruno, who's the morning show anchor at WCIA. Where's Cynthia? Hello. Oh, she's over there. Oh, sorry. Uh, Donald Dodson, who is the director of business news at the News Gazette. 
Dr. Mary Schell, who's a member of Illini After Five Rotary, and also I get up to emphasize eternal thanks to the Rotary for their first place prize of $1,000. And our last uh, judge is Haya Sandler, who's the director of student life here at Parkland. And I also want to make a special note, since we did uh, mention that we have a sponsor for our first place prize, we also do have a sponsor uh, for our one of the $100, uh, I guess that's third place, is uh, Cengage, which is one of our public, uh, publications, so one of our publishers. So they are donating $100, so we're really grateful to them as well. So judges, again, need to remind you to, to fill out both the critique forms and the summary sheet, so there's two things you have to do. And you will have a really hard time. I wish you the best of luck. Bruises, cigarette burns, whip lashes, a child's handprint on their face. These are all things that I have personally seen. Child abuse knows no boundaries. Every child is at risk for abuse or neglect. By volunteering at Crisis Nursery, you can help keep a child out of risk of child abuse or neglect. I have worked at Crisis Nursery for about eight and a half years. I am also the volunteer coordinator. And even more importantly, I'm a parent. So I can tell you firsthand how hard parenting is. Today, tonight we are going to look at how prevalent child abuse is in Champaign County and in Illinois. Then we are going to look at how Crisis Nursery works to prevent it. And then we are going to look at how you personally can volunteer at the nursery. And lastly, we're going to look at some other options for volunteering, even if you don't like playing with children. So child abuse can be devastating not only for the individual, but also for the family and for the community. You might be surprised to know some facts and some statistics about child abuse. So the Department of Ch uh, Children and Family Services, or DCFS, estimates in their 2013 annual report that there were 108 child abuse abu uh, cases reported in Illinois. Just under 30,000 of those were indicated, which means they were found to be true. In Champaign County alone, there were 2,222 cases of child abuse reported, and 587 of those were found to be true. Those numbers are staggering. Voicesforchildren.org estimates that in Illinois, 9.2 out of every 1,000 children will be abused. 14.2 out of every thousand of children will be abused in Champaign County. So Champaign County actually has a higher rate of abuse than the state of Illinois. So let me introduce you to Jack. Jack came to us by way of a safety plan through DCFS. His father had both emotionally and physically abused him. He had cigarette burns on his neck and on his back. He was a two-year-old. He was very sad. He had lots of crying. He wanted to be held, but he didn't want to be held. He didn't know who was safe. Because abuse often um, is very traumatic for children, their behaviors escalate and are very difficult, which makes caring for them also difficult and puts them even more at risk for child abuse and neglect. Mental health um, is an issue for children who have been abused. A lot of times children who have been abused are just at higher risk for mental health issues later on in life. That's not the only indicator, but it's definitely, certainly something that puts them at risk. So we need to have in each community a safe place for children like Jack. So Crisis Nursery. Crisis Nursery's mission is to prevent child abuse and neglect for children who are birthed through the age of six. They're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We never close. We provide all the necessities for each child's stay. So we want to eliminate any barriers that we can for, for families to use us. So we provide diapers, we provide food, we provide formula, we provide toys, we provide a safe, fun, loving environment for them. We also want to provide or eliminate the barriers for the parents. So a lot of times we want the parents to come in and get a tour and visit with the staff so they can see and feel comfortable leaving their children in our care. The goal of the Safe Children Program obviously is to prevent abuse and neglect in the middle of a crisis. So we, um, a lot of times children that come to us come from very unstable support systems. So we want to help make them even more supportive and stable. So not only in addition to our Safe Children Program, we have our Strong Families Program. In that program, we have family specialists that run that and they offer home visits for families, they offer support groups for families, they offer parent-child interaction groups for families that helps facilitate that attachment bond between a parent and a child caregiver. So 
oh, one last fact that I want to make sure you guys know too. So in the unstable support systems, parents will often leave their children with unsafe people. And Darkness Delight Stewards of Children training estimates that one in 10 children will actually be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. And 90% of them will know their abuser. That's staggering and terrifying. And so we want to make sure that we are a safe place for those families to bring their children. So hopefully they will not be abused in any way. So how can you specifically help? By volunteering your time at Crisis Nursery. So last fiscal year, we had 1,100 volunteers give the nursery 17,000 hours of service. That's amazing. The direct result of the volunteers is that we were able to provide 33,000 hours of crisis care to families, helping almost 600 unduplicated children. That's awesome. So most of our volunteers volunteer directly with the children. There is some paperwork that we need and we require, including a background check, references, a physical. We want to make sure that you're safe to volunteer with these children. And they get to do fun things like play bubbles, play chalk, ride bikes, play basketball, do art projects. You get to be directly involved in playing with those kids. We do ask for a two hour a week commitment for hopefully a period of six months. But if you can't give six months, we'll take whatever you can give us. <laughs> We, the easiest way to get involved is to visit our website, which is www.crisisnursery.net and click on volunteer. That will prompt you to fill out an application, which goes directly to me, and then we send you paperwork that you will need to complete. So, I'm sure you're thinking, but what if playing with children just isn't my thing? There are lots of other options at Crisis Nursery. So, you contact me, I'm the volunteer coordinator, like I mentioned before. And we can have you do things like sanitize toys, organize our storage room, put away clean laundry, help with our mailings, help with special events. The options are limitless. <laughs> just contact me. You can volunteer just one time. You can volunteer two times. You can volunteer as, as many or as little as you would like. And the one good thing about volunteering that way is actually you only need to fill out three forms of paperwork. So it's a little bit easier. I even two weeks ago had a group of fifth grade girls uh, put together some goodie bags for our National Volunteer Appreciation Week that we were able to give all of our safe children volunteers, which is pretty awesome. So literally anybody can get involved at some level. So I hope today you have a better understanding of how prevalent child abuse is in Champaign County and in Illinois and how scary those numbers are and how Crisis Nursery specifically keeps children safe from child abuse and neglect. We looked at the statistics, we looked at the nursery's mission and the Safe Children's Program and the Strong Families Program. Then we looked how easy it is for you get to get involved by volunteering and even some ways you can volunteer if you don't like to play with the children. So I hope next time that you see a child, any child, you'll remember that you personally can get actively, actively involved in keeping a child safe from child abuse and neglect. Thank you. I was not ready to go. I stood in the airport watching as a group of kids who I had come to love as my own siblings wished me goodbye. And I just stood there wondering how three months could have gone by so fast. Um, um, and I just stood there wondering how three months could have gone by so fast. You see, I had just had one of the most transformative experiences of my entire life, spending the summer as an intern at a home for orphaned children in Mexico, a home which I had visited twice before in short-term mission trips, and which I will be speaking to you about today. The organization is Niños de Mexico, or Children of Mexico, and while I call Niños a home, it is actually five homes, sped between the Mexico City suburbs of San Vicente and Texcoco where 71 kids deemed unadoptable by their government are given permanent homes. The institution also operates two dormitories for those 18 years and older, giving the kids a place to go when they reach adulthood. And it was just announced Niños will begin oversight of a new home in the Mexican state of San Luis Potosi. Now, you may be asking, uh, that's, that's really good, you know, what they're doing in Mexico, but we have our own problems here. Why should I support an organization there? Fair question. Have you ever heard the saying, a threat to freedom anywhere is a threat to freedom everywhere? Well, I believe a threat to children anywhere is a threat that should concern people everywhere because <coughs> compassion transcends geography. So even though these kids are hundreds of miles away from us, their plight is no less meaningful or worthy of our attention because of where they're located. 
With that in mind, I encourage you to support Niños de Mexico because the work they're doing in the greater Mexico City area, extending physical, educational, and spiritual care to orphaned, homeless, and abandoned children is a much needed and vital work. And I want to bring to your attention two specific ways you can help. The first is sponsoring a child for $25 a month, which goes toward the cost of feeding, schooling, and housing. And the second is getting your church or organization to make a general sponsoring commitment to Niños. Think about how you can help as I outline four different ways the work of Niños is so important. I begin with the primary way Niños carries out its mission, and that is establishing stable, loving homes for the children in their care. The reference work, International Clinical Psychology, published in 2007 and edited by sociologist Dr. Jan Marie Fritz, puts the number of homeless children living in Mexico City on the streets at upwards of 13,000. These are kids without homes, opportunities for schooling, protection from exploiters, and more. And Niños de Mexico takes in these kids. The Niños home I was at during my, uh, during my internship was called Esperanza, or Hope, and it functioned just like any other home. It had house parents, uh, daily chores, playtime, friendly banter. Uh, he took my toy. Well, he hit the soccer ball at my head. Can you tell I was in a house full of all boys? <laughs> A loving atmosphere permeates all the Niños homes because they don't just house children. They create family, which is what children really need. Imagine yourself without your own family. Secondly, Niños seeks to further child education by operating a K-12 school. When kids come to Niños out of traumatic situations, they are often behind in their formal education. Furthermore, severe income inequality in Mexico meant in 2010, 19% of youth between the ages of 15 and 19 were not enrolled in an educational program or working. And if that's not bad enough, according to Dr. Fritz's work, 12%, a full 12% of the kids living on the street in Mexico City are totally illiterate. Therefore, Niños has established a bilingual institute that allows house parents, teachers, and health professionals to address the needs of each child, moving them toward relative educational competency and allowing for further academic success. And currently, two students, Jose Romero, 14, and Isaac, 15, actual friends of mine, finished their junior high school studies early and are now preparing for their high school entrance exams. A remarkable feat. But I wonder how we be if we didn't even have an education. Thirdly, Niños operates a medical clinic with a licensed medical doctor on staff as well as staff psychologists. Again, going back to Dr. Fritz's book, 70% of all the Mexico City street kids abuse illicit drugs, and of the 50% that are sexually active, 43% began that activity between the ages of 7 and 14. It is no surprise then that UNICEF's 2005 literature review of the situation of adolescents in eight Latin American countries and the Caribbean found that 90% of all of Mexico City street kids had been sexually abused. And the executive director of Nino, Steve Ross, tells me that 90% of the students in his institution's care have been emotionally, physically, or sexually abused. This is no joke, and the medical staff at Niños is committed to working with the children to address these problems. As proof of that, the medical doctor on hand was actually one of the first children ever admitted to Niños in the 1960s, who went on to study medicine and came back to give back to the organization. Finally, Niños as a Christian organization is committed to church planting, community outreach, and tending not just to the bodies of their kids, but also their spirits. While Niños requires no profession of faith of any child, they are moved by God's love as they hold to the words of Jesus Christ, that whoever welcomes a child in my name, welcomes me. And I know I speak for the organization when I say that Christ is truly at the center of all they do. Now, we've covered a lot, so in summation, I've argued Niños de Mexico merits your support because the work they do in the greater Mexico City area, educating, empowering, and housing nearly 500 kids over 48 years is a vital and much needed work. And as someone who has seen firsthand the impact they are making in the lives of so many kids, honestly, I can tell you it's worth it. If time permitted, I could tell you so much about my brothers in the Esperanza house. There's Edwin, who has the cutest laugh of any kid you've ever heard and cannot frown for more than two seconds without, excuse me, cannot smile for more than two seconds without breaking into, but he can't frown. He, he, as soon as he frowns, he just starts smiling. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And then there's uh, Moises, whose musical tastes range from Lincoln Park to Bob Marley, and who has wisdom that far outstrips his 15 years. Or Hernan, 
wicked smart, and whose favorite thing, I kid you not, was to sneak under my bed or in my closet and scare me half to death. This went through this process every single day. I just love those kids. However, to some people, they would look at them and see just the products of an unjust and cruel world, but not me. I see them as living examples of the awesome power of God's love and hope. And I pray that you will be inspired to action by their lives like they have inspired me. Thank you very much. So is the dress black and blue or white and gold? Mm -hmm. This question drove millions of people crazy and was to almost no benefit. <laughs> I say almost because the Salvation Army provided a domestic abuse advertisement involving the dress. In the ad, there's a woman lying on the ground wearing a clearly noted white and gold dress. They did this so if you could grab, they could grab your attention to the black and blue bruises along her legs and her arms. To the right of the ad, to the right of the woman, there's a question asking, why is it so hard to see black and blue? This now left people in awe. My charity, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, helps create safer homes for not only children, but adults also with their spouse. As we heard earlier in our speeches, child abuse is rising by day by day. As a disclaimer, I would like to note that women are not the only victims of domestic abuse. They are just as capable as men in being the abuser. To begin, I would like to elaborate on what domestic abuse is and how it happens. Today there's a cluster of controversy on whether or not spanking is okay. Some people say yes, it teaches kids discipline. Others, such as myself, beg to differ. Spanking doesn't do anything but scare your child, and we don't need that today. Domestic abuse, however, takes spanking to an extreme. Some parents smack their kids, some, some punch their kids, and some even have the nerve to reach for the nearest rough material and leave an imprint on their child's back. This is the same with spouse abuse, except they're more careful as to where they leave the marks. They don't want it, them to go out in public and have people notice the bruises on their arms, bruises on their face, or anywhere else that's noticeable. Worst case scenario, the abuse gets out of hand and the abuser takes the victim's life. According to AmericanBAR.org, 1,427 1, women along with 440 men were murdered as a result of domestic abuse by their spouse. There are multiple reasons as to why people do these crimes. One is they just don't have a healthy relationship with their spouse. They either lose attraction to one another, or they just can't agree on simple day-to-day -day tasks. Another is mental illness. Paranoia, depression, anxiety, or even bipolar disorder can result in these actions, or can be the cause of these uh, actions. The final excuse, if you will, for the abuser, they, they were once abused themselves. This goes back to whether spanking is okay. If you abuse your child now, What's to say they won't do it to their kid in the future, or even their spouse? None of these motives are tolerable. Now that we're familiar with the problem, we can discuss my charity, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and what it can do. It creates awareness to everyone and creates programs to help people better understand what exactly is domestic abuse, what can be identified as violent. They construct programs for this. They even provide temporary homes for people that finally can admit that they, they do need help. Because once they do admit to that, where can they go? If they go home, they're either stuck with their abuser and then risk their life being taken away. They even provide pro cosmetic surgery. You're thinking, cosmetic surgery, why is that? As I stated, we don't know how far the abuse can go. They could punch them in the face, as an example, and leave a mark here. Nobody wants to live with that. The, my charity, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, provides money for them, uh, assisting them in payments for the surgery. Your donation has a very clear and distinct purpose. You can watch the shelters be built, you can see the before and after photos of the victims, and you can even participate in the programs to create more awareness. According to GuideStar.com, this charity offers financial information and is also registered with the IRS. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence also received a five-star rating from CharityCheck.com. If you would like to donate, it's very simple. Just go to ncadv.org and click the Donate tab. Lastly, sympathizing with someone with a, in a situation that you haven't had firsthand experience with isn't easy, but it's well worth it if you do. Sean Partridge, a Native American, 
was 13 years old when, her, when she received the news that her stepsister was murdered as a result of domestic abuse. Her family was in disbelief. How did this happen? How did they not see the signs? It, they felt as if it was their fault. It wasn't. So Partridge took initiative and made it clear that she will fight against domestic abuse abusers. As I stated, Partridge is a Native American woman. Thus, her career today, she is the program director of Family and Violence Program of the Muskegee Creek Nation. This instance, this instance with her stepsister has led her to be where she is at today. If that isn't a huge emotional impact, I'm not sure what would be. In conclusion, taking time to understand someone else's potential day-to-day -day struggles can be difficult. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence is a well-known secure charity that will make great use of your donation. We imagine a day in life of an abuse victim. We discuss that there is hope if you are the victim themselves. And we also, and we also heard of worst case scenario of what could happen if you are the victim. Death occurring. Now that we know the causes and signs of domestic abuse, I close with hopes that we can all finally see the true colors. Thank you. Good afternoon. I recently read an article by Alana Vagianos published in the Huffington Post on February 13th of 2015. I was shocked by what she had to say. The death toll for American troops in Iraq and Afghanistan between 2001 and 2012 added up to 6,488 lives lost. And during that very same time period, 11,766 American women were murdered by current or former male partners here at home. If you really think about that, we lost nearly twice as many women to domestic violence as we did soldiers fighting in a war. This afternoon, I would like to shed some light on the very real killer that is domestic violence. And hopefully by the end, I will have illuminated an amazing organization which helps to combat it. Maybe you all are wondering, why is this relevant to me? Why is domestic violence my issue? In order to illustrate the importance of this issue, I would like to share some statistics which I found on domesticviolencestatistics.org, a nonprofit organization which works to end domestic violence through awareness. Every nine seconds, a woman is beaten or assaulted in the United States. At least one in three women around the world has been beaten, coerced into sex, or otherwise abused in her lifetime. Domestic violence is the leading cause of injury to women. There are studies which suggest up to 10 million children have witnessed some form of domestic violence. And the, cost of annual, and the annual cost of intimate partner violence in the United States alone exceeds $5.8 billion. Just think if we were to cut down on some of these numbers. Many women could be saved from serious injury or death. Those little children could be spared the psychological trauma of watching their mother get beaten. And that $5.8 billion that we spend patching up our women could be redistributed into society in many beneficial ways. Some ways I'm sure could benefit you. Now I understand that as normal everyday people, it may seem really daunting to look at something like domestic violence. But by supporting Courage Connection here in Champaign, we can help change the lives of many women and children. Courage Connection is a nonprofit organization which works, to end, which works to end domestic violence through providing homes and supportive services, including the basic necessities such as food, water, and clothing for not only the victims of domestic violence, but also for the homeless of Champaign-Urbana. And in a post on June 5th of 2014 by the city of Champaign, Courage Connection was highlighted as the only agency in the area which offers a full spectrum of services for victims of domestic violence. In order, to, in order to illustrate how we will be making this difference through Courage Connection, I will first be laying out a brief history of how they came to be. I will then be showing you some of the different services which they provide to help these people. And lastly, I will be explaining the many different ways in which, in which each and every one of us can enact this positive difference through Courage Connection. So let's start where it all began. Courage Connection started off as two organizations coming together as one. 
According to their webpage, CourageConnection.org, the two organizations are as follows. A Woman's Place was the first battered woman's shelter to be opened in Illinois circa 1971 and operated by a woman's fund here in Urbana. The second organization is the Center for Women in Transition, which was a homeless shelter that also has a resale store to fund its operations. In 2010, these two, op these two organizations came together to form a powerful coalition which works to provide anything from emergency shelter to a stable lifestyle once again for its clientele. Now that we've seen how Courage Connection came to be, let's take a look at some of the different services that they provide. One of the biggest ways that Courage Connection helps these women and children is by providing emergency shelter. In psychology class, I learned that safe transitional housing is extremely important because in the three weeks after a woman has left her abuser, she is at the most risk to be stalked down and murdered because he no longer has anything to lose. Another big service that Courage Connection provides for these people is helping the women find jobs. This is so important because one of the most common reasons that women return to their abusers is out of financial dependency. So by helping these women get back into the workforce, not only are we helping society, but we are really cutting down on the chances that they are going to go back and get abused once again. The last service that I'm going to talk about today, though there are many more, is that Courage Connection has been highly successful in helping their clients obtain court orders against their abusers. So now that we have talked about some of the different services that Courage Connection provides, Let's take a look at the many different ways in which each and every one of us can become involved. One of the biggest ways that you can help is by volunteering. There are a lot of different volunteer opportunities that you can do. One of which is working as a daycare worker for those women who are going out and doing job interviews and um, just working to get back into the lifestyle. Another way is by becoming a member of their, res their resale store, which is in Lincoln Square Mall. And the last way that I'm going to talk about is that you can um, help these women on their job applications and you can help them get ready for interviews and do all sorts of things like that. Another way that you can support Courage Connection is by going to an event sponsored by their partners in the community. I recently attended a, fashion, a Power and Soul fashion show where all of the proceeds went to Courage Connection. I left this event feeling very uplifted because I'd, I knew I'd been a part of something that was much bigger than myself. The last way that I'll talk about today is that if you're short on time, you can do direct donations to their website, courageconnection.org. A small amount like $5 could help feed a little boy who has had his life turned upside down. I encourage all of you to go to courageconnection.org. You can fill out a volunteer application and you can check out all the different opportunities to see if anything sparks your interest. By supporting Courage Connection, we are not only taking a stand to domestic violence on a large scale, we are also supporting our mothers, daughters, sisters. In order to take a stand to domestic violence and help these women and children who have been who have been brutalized, we need to support Courage Connection. I encourage you to do whatever you can for this organization, even if it is just donating an hour of your day or $5 for, or five dollars for that little boy who has seen too much. By doing this, you will be enacting a positive change and hopefully reducing the death toll so those troops who are fighting overseas don't come home to even more death. Thank you. Imagine holding your newborn baby for the first time and instantly picturing your new life together. As a parent, you will always be aware of the risk of sicknesses that can happen, but nobody ever thinks that their child will be the one diagnosed. There are many causes of death among children, but what many people do not realize is that while childhood cancer is rare, it is still the number one leading death among the adolescent. You may never have to endure this type of heartbreak, but what if you did? What if it was your child being diagnosed with cancer? Reading Melissa's strong, strong story hit close to home. She was diagnosed with AML, acute myeloid leukemia, when she was only two years old. 
This is the same age my son is right now. And as a parent, I don't know what I would do if my child were diagnosed with cancer. Melissa underwent five rounds of chemotherapy, which originally cleared her leukemia. But this was not the end to her fight. So I'm calling on you today to donate to the Cure Childhood Cancer Foundation as they are dedicated to finding a cure. And they believe that we can find a cure within this lifetime. So today I will help you to understand the severity of childhood cancer and the devastating effects it can have on the family and loved ones. Then I will teach you of what the Cure Childhood Fan Cancer Foundation does and how to donate. And lastly, I will illuminate how donating can help save the lives of many children. Thousands of children are diagnosed every year, and this affects children nationwide. According to the American, American Childhood Cancer Organization, globally, more than 250,000 children are diagnosed with cancer every single year. And according to the National Cancer Institute, nearly 16,000 of these children will be diagnosed in the United States. And according to CURE, there are more than 25 different types of childhood cancers. Childhood cancers are also more aggressive, tend to be more aggressive than adult cancers. And they also require separate research and programs and treatment programs. So what happens when a child is diagnosed? The American Cancer Society lists some, lists a few treatments being surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. But many children have to undergo many type, different types of treatments, not just one. There are also many side effects to these treatments. The Kids Health Organization lists a few as anemia, fatigue, flu-like symptoms, nausea, hair loss, vomiting, loss of appetite, joint pain, and these are not all of them. These treatments are also extremely expensive. So aside from having to worry about your child being diagnosed with cancer, you also have to worry about how you are going to pay for their treatments. So as you can see, parents and children are powerfully affected by these diseases. Many, many find comfort and participation in family therapy or even individual therapy. So now that you know the severity of childhood cancer, I would like to educate you on the Cure Childhood Cancer Foundation and how to donate. Cure started in 1975 by Dr. Abdel Ragab in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Ragab saw a need for a pediatric oncology department research program a demand for support programs for children and their families, and also a requirement for adequate funding. Their mission statement is, and I quote, dedicated to conquering childhood cancer through funding targeted research and through the support of patients and their families. CURE has helped thousands of families so far. Through raising money through events, walks, and picnics, they also provide emergency financial assistance, transportation assistance, and they have also developed an open arms meal program that provides meals to children and their families that are admitted into the hospital. CURE also provides counseling services to the patients and their families with a total of six extremely discounted services, and they also provide workshops that are completely free of charge. CURE is a high status organization it has been awarded with the Independent Charity Seal of Excellence. And of the million charities in America, it is estimated that less than 50,000 or 5% charities meet these standards, and out of those, less than 2,000 are awarded with this seal. Cure Childhood F Cancer Foundation has received four star ratings by the Charity Navigator in the past nine out of 10 years. So I urge you to donate to this trusted organization. To donate, go to www.curechildhoodcancer.org. And from experience, I can tell you that it is extremely easy to donate. All you have to do is click on the Click Here to Donate button that will pop up on the main page. You, all you have to enter is your amount, your name, your card information, 
And you can also personalize your donation if there's a specific patient that you would like to donate to. So remember the little girl from the beginning of my speech? Originally cleared of her cancer, she relapsed in her leukemia. She now requires experimental treatments. Exper she now requires an experimental bone marrow transplant um, in hopes of curing her leukemia. These experimental treatments are just a small amount of what your donations go towards. Melissa is currently waiting at St. Jude's Hospital in Atlanta to hopefully cure her leukemia with this experimental um, procedure. Melissa has been an amazing spirit throughout all of this. All of her nurses say that even after her most intense days, she has always had a smile on her face. So imagine helping a child like Melissa. How rewarding would that be? The severity of childhood cancer is overwhelming. From the effects it can have on the children, to the effects it can have on their family and loved ones, to the effects it can potentially have on their future, this needs to stop. With your donations to CURE, we can help cure childhood cancer and save lives like Melissa's every single day. No child deserves to spend their days admitted into hospitals, going through treatments and procedures. They deserve to be playing outside, living carefree, and having fun. So I urge you to go to CURE today. Don't wait. CURE believes that we can CURE believes that we can find a cure within this lifetime, and we can, but we have to do it together. Thank you. So let us start, we'll start with fifth place, and that goes to, dun 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 dun, Sonia, I still can't say it right. Sadie, Sadie. 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 just say Sadie, okay, Sadie, yay. <laughs> Congratulations! Yeah, yeah. For the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you judges. Thanks. Yay. Fourth place goes to Courtney Arthur. <laughs> all right, all right. Come. <laughs> you have to come all the way over here. Thank you. Get the little ca look for the camera. Look for the camera. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yay. Third place goes to Rebecca Freeman. All right. So maybe by third time I'll have this all down. So here we'll. We'll shake hands. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Here we go. Getting down to the wire here. So second place goes to Mackenzie Martin. Congratulations. Go do the camera thing. There you go. Congratulations. And of course, now we know Eric Miller, come on down. So not only does he get first place, but also his charity gets first place. So congratulations. So that concludes our, our ceremony, our contest. So thank you all again for coming and participating. We really appreciate it. And thanks so much. Have a great evening. <laughs>